Dear all, welcome to one more Anamet Library Talk, a joint organization of the Anamet Library and the History Foundation. I'm Vasya Mole, the head librarian of Anamet Library, and today our talk is titled From the Museum to the Living Room, the Unseen Heritages of the Greek Community of Istanbul. This talk will explore how memory mapping and filmmaking are used as ways of presenting alternative heritages and histories that capture the emotional vividness of these practices and create memory resources with and for the community, as well as for wider audiences. To present the story of the Greek or Rum communities of Istanbul, we are hosting Gionul uh, Bozoglu. Ms. Bozoglu is a Leverhulm fellow at Newcastle University, researching heritages and memory cultures of marginalized groups. She completed her PhD with a thesis on Turkish historical museums and memory cultures, which became her book, Museums, Emotion and Memory Culture, The Politics of the Past in Turkey. She's currently working on a new book titled Words of Memory and Sensory Heritage, Living with the Past in the Greek Communities of Istanbul. For this discussion, the speaker is accompanied by Mes Daubier, an associate professor at Aarhus University in Denmark. His main research concerns the intersections of gray zones between heritage practices, experience-oriented tourism, and identity work. Besides his teaching and supervision at the Department of Anthropology at Aarhus University, he also contributes to the university's interdisciplinary master programs in sustainable heritage management and experience economy. Before we start, I would like to mention that your microphones and cameras have been turned off and this session is being recorded. You are very welcome to ask your questions using the chat function and the speakers will reply to you all after the end of their discussion. Enjoy. Thank you. Uh, Vasiliki, uh, as, uh, as you said, I'm Mastalpia and I've been, uh, I'm honored to be here today to be part of this. Uh, it is a presentation of Gunnel Bosolius' work, as you already said, but I've been allowed to take part in it and also moderate the uh, questions and answers uh, session that follows. Um, uh, as you said, I'm a, an associate professor of anthropology at Aarhus University, uh, and uh, I'm really looking forward to today. Uh, Gunil and I have uh, uh, organized this as a discussion. It will mostly be uh, Gunil presenting her work, um, but we will uh, take uh, time to also intersect her presentation with uh, three small uh, discussion uh, sessions uh, between uh, Gunil and myself. Um, and after uh, Gunil's presentation and uh, our uh, internal uh, discussion, we will open the, um, the floor, as we say in conferences, usually to uh, questions from the audience. And at that point, uh, I'll come back to this, but at, a, at that point, I'll ask you to, uh, to if you have questions, to uh, write them in the chat and then I will um, be reading them or as many of them as I can uh, uh, to Gunu and, and discuss them with her. Um, right, but before I hand the microphone and the uh, presentation floor to Gunu, I will I'll just frame the discussions uh, slightly more by saying that, that uh, Gunu and I know each other from having worked together in a previous large European project, which focused on how heritage and, and historical traces understand very, understood very broadly um, are being used today to, to underpin contemporary life uh, across Europe in different ways. And just to, to frame, what do we mean when we say heritage? I'm sure Gunnar will talk about this as well. But um, uh, in that earlier project, we were interested in the kinds of histories and heritage that make people uh, come together and underpin common understandings of uh, Europe, European community, European history. But we were also interested in uh, uh, those cases where heritage or references to the past were being used to separate or to exclude um, those understood to be outside or, or not belong to, to us uh, in inverted commas. So in, in, the, in that perspective, heritage 
is not a, a thing in itself. It doesn't exist uh, as such, uh, as a separate entity, but um, uh, it is meant, uh, and, and we were not out to, to define one uh, correct European heritage, for instance, or Turkish or Danish or whatever. Um, but we were interested precisely in how people uh, utilize and use uh, references to the past, uh, materials from the past, traces, traditions, and so on, uh, to underpin their uh, contemporary lives. Um, so uh, that perspective, I think, is uh, is important to bear in mind when we when we uh, go through uh, today's proceedings. Uh, heritage, you could say, not as a thing, but as a process, as as a set of relations, and uh, therefore also a perspective in which the past is, of course, very important, but where it is always the relationship between past and present that is uh, in focus. And I think that would be the case for today's uh, talk as well. Um, finally, I should say that I am uh, indeed not myself an expert in uh, Greek uh, or Turkish heritage in any way, even though I've been to Istanbul uh, with Gunil and others. Um, my own work con concerns uh, Danish, uh, uh, to some degree German, and also US American heritage. Um, so in my discussions, I will be interested in teasing out the more general um, points that we can take from Gunnel's work um, amongst the, um, the Greek communities of Istanbul. So uh, with this long framing, uh, I, will, I will hand it over to you, Gunnel, and, and uh, just to repeat, um, the uh, title of, of um, Gunnel's presentation, uh, which I'm looking very much forward to, is From the Museum to the Living Room, the Unseen Heritages of the Greek Communities of Istanbul. So please share your screen, Gunnel, and I will silent my uh, microphone for a while at least. Okay, and uh, now I think we're ready. Can you hear me? Yeah, cool. Okay, well, thank you, Mas. Uh, and well, first of all, uh, uh, thank you very much to Vasya for the invitation to give this talk. And uh, of course, it's great to be here, uh, at least uh, virtually, but normally at this point uh, in the year, I will be in Turkey, but because of the you know, uh, com uh, COVID situation, unfortunately, I couldn't make it and I'm speaking to you from Newcastle. So uh, I want to uh, also thank Mass uh, for joining uh, today, and I'm very much looking forward to his comments. <laughs> So uh, I'll just start uh, with what you see here in this uh, picture. So this is what I call the Istanbul corner of my uh, research participants' uh, living room. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, this particular living room is in Athens, and it's in the uh, home of a man called Dimitris, who will meet again during this talk quite a lot. So Dimitris was a young boy when his parents were deported during the 1964 expulsions of Greek passport uh, holders from Istanbul. In this corner, there is a collection of carefully displayed objects connected to his uh, memory and personal history in Istanbul. There is uh, his baptism uh, certificate from the Patriarchate in Fenash, uh, black and white prince of old Istanbul, um, photographs of his parents, and out of short is an uh, old radio from Istanbul, and this is a quite a big one. Actually, you will see that picture in the uh, next uh, slide. So the clock was from his uncle's house in Bukada. Uh, the sewing machine was his mother's. I don't know the story of this, but he promised uh, to tell me when I see him next, which is quite soon, hopefully. So uh, it's a domestic uh, space, but um, uh, but with a museum-like qualities. It looks it looks like a bit like a period room in a museum. It is not a space to be used like other areas of daily life, but it is used in other ways. 
as a space of memory, a, a, a way of connecting to the past and perhaps inhabiting the past, a means of uh, bridging between then and now and between uh, here and there. Uh, in a way, it's a space that comes uh, from an experience of displacement. And although uh, it, it looks quite formal, it is a personal space about personal history. What does it mean for us to think about heritage in, a, in, in this way? Not through national stories and monuments, but through the lens of the uh, personal and private. Uh, okay, so oops, wrong one. Yeah. So in my PhD and the book that came later, um, I explored the uh, state uh, 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 level narratives, how uh, certain museums tell particular uh, stories about the Turkish nation, for example, talking about uh, 1453 or uh, uh, Atatürk. After thinking about all of these national level stories and how the state uses them, I wanted to explore heritage and memory at a different scale. In particular, the stories that uh, don't make the museum or into other public spaces. I have also become very interested in a concept of heritage as something that can be very personal, even private, community-based and not shown in a big, uh, in a, in a big museum. Instead, it can be found in people's living rooms or in their personal photography collections. Uh, I will explore this uh, in a bit. So my research has moved from the big museum with uh, lots of visitors to the living room. But there are commonalities uh, between the two that uh, interests me and hopefully I will il illustrate some of, uh, some of this later on. So uh, my analysis, analysis of the Panorama 1453 Museum in Istanbul looked at emotional practice, both the ways in which the visitor experience uh, is designed and in the emotional behavior of uh, visitors themselves, which I studied through various uh, kinds of uh, visitor studies, including actually some uh, extensive uh, interviews with the visitors. The spectacular panorama representations put you, uh, as a visitor, in the position of the Ottoman advance on the city in an uh, immersive way, as well as the panorama. Uh, there are 3D uh, diorama elements, including uh, uh, replicas of famous canons, uh, and, uh, is, uh, and uh, there is the noise of battle, so the scenes are dramatic and heroic, inviting visitors to be amazed, but also to identify with the Ottomans who lay siege. Uh, meanwhile, key well-known narratives provide emotional opportunities, as you see in the picture, such as the story of Hassan of Ulubat, who raises the Ottoman flag, even though he is heavily injured. Many of the visitors know this stories and become highly emotional when they see them represented in the museum. Um, Laurie Jane Smith and uh, Gary Campbell have argued that museums and heritage sites are places uh, where people go to feel as much as they might go to such places to learn, uh, maybe even more. So in my uh, research, um, Many visitors knew uh, well what kind of emotional experience they were going to ha have when they visited the museum and were actively seeking this. In this sense, we can uh, talk about the kind of um, emotional contract between the museum and the visitor. Uh, my argument in the book uh, is that this connects to a complex network of social and political relationships, including uh, the AKP's, you know, today government's uh, interest in promoting 1453 as a glorious uh, national story. It's also about the needs of uh, their water base for uh, just such a powerful story that can stand against secularism and the iconic public historiography of Atatürk. This is a group that needs an alternative set of narratives and 
icons, uh, like many groups do. Uh, so we are dealing in cases like 1453 and also the uh, Republican uh, historiography of Atatürk, which we can find in other museums and sites with profoundly public, large scale events and uh, per personalities, heroes, um, uh, victorious wars, great leaders, in a word, epic and epic the word that I borrowed, uh, I borrowed from um, uh, Orhan Pamuk, and I will come back to that. So, um, what what happens if we go to the other end uh, uh, of the scale to talk about the minor, the private, and the personal and um, unknown traces and representations of the past? that can also be profoundly meaningful and emotional in different ways. And these are parts of chandeliers. Uh, uh, these are called small pandan prisms kept by one of my research participants from the Greek community of Istanbul, an older man who now lives in Athens. During the 1955 pogrom, he was a 10 year old boy and secretly took these prisms from Ayatriada church in uh, Perases in, uh, on the label, like today's Taksim, and uh, Aya Nikolas in Halki, which is Heybeliada uh, in Turkish. So the churches had been wrecked by attackers. Uh, now they are conserved in this box and labeled like museum objects. They have meaning uh, for him as relics of a moment of crisis and disasters. Uh, a reminder that it's, this needs to be kept safe and enables the memory of violence to be conserved. It also enables uh, emotional practice, although of a very different kind of uh, kind, a kind from what we saw uh, in the museum. It is not glorious. It is not a victory. It is not spectacular and this is an event that has a little visibility in public and national historiography. And yet, uh, despite the apparent modesty of these objects and their museum-like treatment, they are prisms also in a metaphorical sense for profoundly meaningful stories of loss and um, violence that intersect with the, with the individual personal history of this man and his family. Uh, it is one of the ways in which, the, uh, uh, which he situates himself in relation to the past and makes sense of what happened and what that means for his present. If people go to museums and heritage sites to feel, then there is something similar here. Um, this is an object that uh, its owner conserves and engages with also in order to feel and to understand uh, the past and the present. Uh, the object is part of a psychic network between person and history. In this case, there isn't a, a museum he can go to in order to feel and to practice emotion about the past in question, like uh, we saw with the other visitors um, earlier on. So perhaps he has made a kind of museum in his living room in a way that is comparable to the Istanbul corner I, I showed you at the beginning. Um, so my point with this uh, con contrast is to reflect on what matters and where heritage is. Is it in the big structures of the walls of Constantinople and the great stories of heroism? Is it in the prisms of chandelier that is not a public object, is perhaps only seen by one or two people in an elderly man's living room that I had privileged, uh, pri privileged access to? So you may have your opinions about this. Perhaps the chandelier prism has uh, no value as heritage for some people because of its minor nature. But for me, this is a different kind of heritage. We may indeed say that both the walls and the prism are heritage, perhaps of different kinds. But in response, I would say that our concept of what matters 
and what is classed as heritage needs to change. And of course, what is treated and celebrated as heritage is all, uh, only the major, the outstanding, the iconic. So in my book on museum, a Turkish museum and <coughs> memory politics, I work with an idea of the um, uh, affective uh, atmosphere as co-produced by uh, museum representations and visitors' expectations, dispositions and behaviors, uh, different from theoretical writings that pose affect as a precognitive pre and extra discursive. So I developed that here, looking at the creation of maintenance of an atmosphere of a world of memory as a kind of artifact assembled from uh, interacting materials and practices. This is about how people interact with old photographs, significant objects, well-worn stories, emotional habits, and what kinds of performing, referencing, reflection and um, talking takes place to make a world of memory in the present with its own atmosphere that can be uh, fully described in other ways. So uh, here I will quote Laura Jane Smith uh, again in relation to another concept. Smith has characterized his iconic major scale understanding of heritage as um, authorized heritage discourse. Um, this is the idea that uh, certain heritages become dominant. Only certain historical stories get told and only uh, they they only get told uh, in certain way in, in certain ways. So another problem with AHD is that it can have the effect of silencing other histories that authorities don't think are important or that they don't like. These histories don't end up in museums and they don't appear in heritage sites or in history lessons at school. So my first book is definitely about AHD, but now I'm looking at the histories that um, we don't see, uh, uh, we don't see perhaps unauthorized heritage, perhaps personal and small, but still vital for people to think about their lives and identities. At the same time here, um, uh, there, uh, uh, there have been moves in museums and in heritage to think about minor things. Orhan Pamuk famously called for museums to be novels, uh, not epics, and to explore the everyday, the unex uh, unexceptional human lives, and not the grand stories of nations, much as his uh, novels do, and of course the Museum uh, of Innocence in Istanbul. New heritage theory, uh, uh, including uh, work uh, by my colleagues and me uh, uh, did, um, has used these insights from uh, Erin Manning's book, The Minor Gesture, to re uh, rethink the grand structures and mechanisms of heritage to think more about the personal, the everyday, the mundane against uh, 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 UNESCO's World Heritage Principle of Outstanding Universal Value what if heritage does not always have universal value? And perhaps it never really does. What if heritage doesn't always need to be outstanding or things can be outstanding in their own ways that we do not accommodate uh, very well in heritage policy? How do we engage with heritages that don't make it into the public eye? This is also uh, linked to political dimensions when heritages are difficult for nations to deal with, as with the maybe history of persecution of uh, uh, Greeks uh, of Istanbul uh, in Turkey. So before I move on, maybe uh, now uh, we can have mass in <laughs> and then we can yes. continue. Because <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Gunu. Uh, I hope I am, and that you can hear me. Yeah. I can't see myself yet, but maybe that's just because uh, we I can only see the presenter. Can yeah, hear it quite well. Okay, let me see uh, if I can do like this. 
All right. Um, thank you, Gunnar. This was a really exciting uh, introduction to your work. And um, I'm really looking forward to, to uh, the remaining examples of the, of the specifics of the, of the Greek um, heritages of Istanbul. We, we had the small example of Dimitris, which I really enjoyed. Uh, but you used the, the, the first part here to, uh, to establish this uh, call, we may say, or need for another perspective on, on heritage, on the mundane, as you say, on the banal, or as you are heading, uh, your title today uh, has it, the unseen heritages. I think that's, a, that's an interesting concept, and maybe I could start there by asking you about that, because um, <clears throat> it strikes me when we saw Dimitris's little corner uh, of his living room that, well, in a sense, it's, it's unseen or it's, it's secret in the, on, I mean, in the grand scale of things. We don't, it's not on the scale of the, the 1453 uh, panorama and so on. But still, it's 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 so uh, nicely designed by Dimitris, I suppose himself. So uh, I suppose it's um, my question would be why is it important for someone like him or some of your other um, discussion partners? Why is it important to make this visible? I mean, it's 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 not completely unseen. It's designed. Is it designed only for himself in this case? Is it his own? resonance with his memories and so on that is at the center or is it also to some degree a public statement for you know for visitors for someone like you or maybe others i mean um, to what degree is it um, is it his private i mean completely private recollections uh, and and uh, to what degree is it actually important that it is seen by others to some degree mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, first of all, uh, well, we can start with a small banal unseen uh, word, uh, like uh, there is a there is a recognition issue here, which is unseen. Uh, if something is unseen or hidden, we need to think. Uh, we need to ask why. In some cases, there may be political reasons for excluding some uh, histories that connect to the long-term marginalization of communities. And, you know, we just need to start with some questions like, why do we learn in school about some historians, but not others? Why do we see some uh, stories in museums, but not others? Uh, you can say that it may be because not all stories are equally important at some kind of objective level, but obviously there is always a political decision being made about uh, what counts as important and whose history matters. So that is something for heritage actors to be very careful about. At least, you know, questioning is, I think, important. And uh, now, you can think about why should we label small stuff as heritage? Uh, one reason is that marginalized histories are uh, most often uh, materialized uh, in this way. This is obviously the case uh, with displacements, uh, for example, you know, where people could only take certain things, but those things then become highly important in their worlds. As humans and individuals, we all have our own interior senses of ourselves and histories, and we stand in a relation to the past. So for me, these little things, little details, what we saw, and I'll show more examples, that's heritage. Uh, for me, it doesn't need to be universal in that uh, means. So, uh, uh, and, you know, it doesn't have to have the same meaning to everyone on the planet. But by calling uh, small things and hidden stories heritage, uh, we give them a symbolic value that can help to work against marginalization or otherness. So if people don't agree about what heritage is or where it is, that's okay. I mean, you know, 
but at least we should give space to <laughs> other people who think this is heritage. I think this is mm -hmm. often the case as well in heritage uh, uh, world that some uh, kind of definition, some kind of certain people get the domination mm -hmm. but you know this is this is my view and uh, that it's it's what interests me and, but I'm of course also interested in architecture of Mimar Sinan in Istanbul or Hagia Sophia but that doesn't mean we can we cannot also think about mm -hmm. different scales uh, and manifestations of heritage and is it also that's 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 great, Gunilai, and I completely agree about the importance of, of, uh, of these kinds of recognition. Is it also important to the people themselves? Is it important to Dimitris, for example, that this is recognized as something other than his personal memory? Yeah. Uh, when you interview him, or, or how, how is he referring to this? Is, is, it, is it all in his head, or is it, is it something that he's also... Um, eager to, to, you know, um, uh, get others to know about, so to yeah. speak. Is there, a, in other words, is there a political move uh, or impulse uh, amongst these people? I, I realize that this can be a sensitive uh, territory in, in Turkey, um, mm -hmm. but, 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 but is there also this um, impulse to, to make these things known to others? Yeah, I think, you know, they, uh, they want to be recognized, <laughs> they want to be heard. I mean, we can't generalize. Of course, also it's allowed to say no. I know that some people don't want to be interviewed, they don't want to be, you know, in a part, because also we have to, uh, as a start, we need to remember that this is a, you know, a diverse group uh, and, uh, you know, heterogeneous group with different uh, demands, but if there are NGOs, if there are some uh, organizations, if there are some uh, events about, uh, you know, uh, surviving, uh, and uh, of course, you know, they they want to be part of it. Like, I mean, like I do just, I'm just a researcher and I go to them and I make a film um, with them. I, you know, I co-produce the website with them and they, they, they really wanted that. They share their personal stories and, and often, you know, I, I still keep in touch. My interview doesn't finish in Athens or in Istanbul. I, I'm in contact with them and they see what I do and then they say, actually, look, I have this photo. I think it will help your story. And, you know, they're all public and they often thank me which also bothers me <laughs> they shouldn't thank me because <laughs> this is not something that uh, I'm you know doing for favorite this is uh, you know this is what we should do we should work together so mm. yes they do want to I think that's what we should listen to that's why it's important to talk to them what do you want you know and of course they want to be recognized because they are the citizens mm. of uh, both countries and also they are you know linked to uh, you know, like uh, Istanbul's social life, you know, this is, or Istanbul's history, or it's the same in Athens. You know, who are these people came from Istanbul and they've been living here and they don't, people don't know much about them. So, yeah, and they, and of course, if they don't want to be heard, that's fine, but some do. So we mm. have to listen mm. to their stories. We have to understand what, what they want and how they want to be represented. Mm. So I think, uh, Bruno, I think you should be uh, be allowed to progress in a minute. But I just, I mean, I have other questions, but but some of them uh, relate to, uh, I think, uh, examples and so on that you will uh, that you will present uh, after. And uh, but but I do, I would like to say, I mean, I know we're not talking here today about your previous work in the in the big institutions, but but you are setting up. Uh, a kind of distinction, if I if I understand you correctly. So on the one hand, you're saying this is very different from the big panoramas and the, and the and big museums. Uh, on the other hand, if I understand you correctly, you also say, well, in a sense, these small displays and and recollections are not that different from from the larger institutions in how they work for the for the individual. Uh, yeah, you may correct me if I'm wrong, but but I really like your take on um, how emotions are um, well they are being uh, 
almost pre-experienced in the in the big uh, institutions. So you had this uh, uh, great concept from your previous book about the uh, the emotional contract that the place that the big museum or panorama uh, makes with the with the um, with the visitors and with visitors, you know, expecting a certain emotional response and almost you know uh, preparing themselves for it, I suppose. And um, so, so, so uh, 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 just a, out of curiosity, is this, do you see the small, uh, modest, uh, unseen uh, uh, heritage sites that you also study in the same way? I, could you also say that in Dimitri's case that there is an emotional, maybe not a contract, uh, because he's both the designer and the, and the consumer, I suppose, but, but is it... Um, is it not the same? I mean, I re realize there's a difference in scale, but is it not uh, in terms of design and emotional expectation and so on? Is it not the same set of operations, or is, or are you arguing that there's a distinct difference there? Uh, yeah, I think you put it nicely. Yes, there are differences and maybe some commonalities. <laughs> but it's all about, first of all, as I start, it's about feelings and connections, how we connect mm. with the past, which past. And of course, that links to the identity. But anyway, there is no time to get into that. But maybe I can talk about atmosphere in relation to that, if you like. Uh, so, for example, you know, in the book, uh, and, and, you know, here, I also mentioned very briefly, so there is this uh, literature about, uh, you know, what atmosphere is, how it's created, but, uh, and of course, you know, there are disagreements. Uh, so for me, uh, an atmosphere is made as a kind of interplay between, uh, like, environmental prompts and people. Uh, so in a case of a museum, an atmosphere is like the museum that I show, for example, is made by a spectacular panorama, battle music and well-known stories of heroism. I mean, when I interviewed people, people already knew and they were looking for some characters and they said, oh, it's great that they didn't forget about uh, Akshem Settino or Uloha Patla Hassan. So they knew all the characters. Uh, so, uh, uh, but you know, but this is not enough. Uh, I've been to museum many times in different periods. Sometimes when there were a lot of visitors, the atmosphere was different. So when it was empty, I didn't notice some of the, you know, prompts from the museums actually. So uh, it needs basically visitors who know these stories and respond emotionally. So the crowd behavior is important too. Uh, that's why I called it contract between, it's like a, you know, uh, unseen <laughs> contracts at the background. Uh, so, uh, I mean, we, the very classic example is a football stadium. Uh, you know, imagine, it's fit, you know, it's like designed and it's a massive, spectacular place. But when it's empty, it's a different place. I've been to, you know, football game and it's not like uh, you like watching <laughs> from, from the TV. So again, you need both. You need that space plus you need people to be there and seeing each other and you know cheering and stuff a bit like that. But uh, I think with people, how people use their memories is like a bit different and more complex because they actually also build their atmosphere in a maybe different scale. But it's a you know it's about their memories, photographs, objects, and stories to uh, you know link with the past uh, and sometimes, um, uh, you know, even uh, to reconstruct it mentally. So, but I think I'll give you some examples through uh, the presentation and hopefully it will make more sense in the smaller scale. Great. So please, please go on Gunnar and we'll have another, yeah. another break in, a, in a, <laughs> a few more slides down the road. So here now um, I, I just want to give a little bit of a context about this community. I know some of you already know, uh, but maybe not everyone. So this uh, research is about the memory world of the 
historic Greek community of Istanbul. Uh, they are called Rum in Turkish, which comes from the word Roman. And this refers to the Eastern Roman uh, Empire, uh, what's also called uh, Byzantine uh, Empire. There was always a presence of this community since the Byzantine period in Istanbul. Uh, and it's a diminishing and aging community, uh, which has been subject to marginalization. And because of political persecution, many uh, rooms emigrated to Greece. Well, this is also a bit complicated to understand because uh, actually these were Greeks uh, never, uh, who had never lived in modern day Greece or never even been. Uh, so for the diaspora community in Athens, uh, Byzantine Istanbul and their own Istanbul life stories are important touchstones of identity. My work is showing that members of diaspora uh, still mentally inhabit Istanbul through social memory practices of reminiscence, archiving um, and organizing community talks and exhibitions. Uh, but they have uh, different memory relations from the Greeks who remained in Istanbul, but we can, I don't know if there's time, we can talk about that, but there is, there are also commonalities. Uh, so I'm, you know, trying to understand all these complex cities uh, in the community memory. So um, on the slide, you see some of the outlines of historical events that took place between Turkey and Greece. Of course, some events go back to, you know, pre Turkey and uh, Greece nation states. But in the end, these, all these relationships affected uh, Istanbul's Greeks uh, political and social positions. So these are marked in white. Uh, the list in the red is what uh, rooms went through in the 20th century. Again, this is not the complete list because we don't have time to go through these historical things. Uh, but I just give you some examples to sort of, uh, sh you know, give a sense about their position. So, uh, for example, this is just one of the events that is part of a long history of marginalization of the Greek community through states sponsored violence and different legal, political and uh, social processes. This is one of the churches where I work with people on the right. Uh, so the churches, uh, the churchyard is still in a chaotic state and has not changed since it was uh, pledged in 1955. Now volunteers are cataloging the rubble. This is uh, one of my participants showing me the damage to one of the old church doors uh, after people tried to prize it uh, open during the attack in 1955. The church today has been restored, but what you see here is the original pieces from the previous churchyard in the backyard. So if you go to this uh, church, you won't see it, but you know what you see is restored church. But uh, you know you can, uh, um, uh, yeah, the, you can see these traces at, at the backyard, which is closed. So 1955 pogrom often appears in my data, uh, but sometimes people don't want to talk about this, uh, but sometimes uh, they start their conversation uh, with this event. Uh, uh, so another key example comes in 1964, when 30,000 Greeks were exiled from Istanbul and many settled in Athens. Actually, the number includes some Turkish, Armenian and uh, Greeks with Turkish citizenship because of marriage. So um, this event followed the de-announcement of the Treaty of Friendship that was signed in 1930 between Greece and Turkey. This treaty alongside the Treaty of Lausanne had allowed the rooms who held Greek passports to stay in Istanbul. And many of these people had never been to Greece, as I said, and Dimitris, uh, that you, uh, you will see again, also had the same situation. So all these events, you know, uh, this um, goes back to the earlier focus on personal stories, but we need to set this into a wider context, not just as a limited community uh, history issue, but one that has relevance for everyone connected to Istanbul to help us understand the social and political history of the city and to make sure uh, certain stories don't get lost. Whatever group uh, people think they are from in Istanbul, they share the city and it's very important to understand what has happened uh, uh, there over time. So um, a little bit about my uh, 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 
method. So in my field work, which means uh, spending lots of time uh, in, in both Istanbul and Athens and interviewing participants semi-conversationally, often for hours, going to their events, uh, religious services, and sometimes actually staying uh, with families for long periods of time. So as part of that, I also do walking interviews with com community members in Istanbul, but because of the age and some, uh, you know, some mobility problems plus the distance, uh, I mainly do sedentary interviews. Uh, in which people do what I call memory walking, uh, which is remembering their old roots and the stories that they call up, sometimes traumatic stories of violence and persecution, sometimes more everyday or joyous recollections of the weekly walk from uh, church, uh, uh, uh church or you know from home or uh, so on so memory walking is how people mentally retrace their steps remember and in a sense reconstruct ment uh, mentally particular places uh, events and often in very uh, vivid sense, uh, sensory detail, and I'll show you some examples. So I'm interested in how people remember with their senses, how they evoke the places and times that were uh, formative for them. Uh, so hopefully with the examples, it will make more sense. So what I'm trying to understand is their memory world. Uh, what I mean by memory world uh, is the imaginative, sensory and uh, storied world made by remembering people, particularly in situations of loss or change, in order to live with the past in the present and make sense of their experiences in personal and uh, community dimensions. My research is showing how people, especially uh, older generations, make worlds of memory through communicating about the past, evoking sense memories, remembering people, places, practices, the banal details of everyday life, such as a food um, shop going or church going, and sometimes their experiences of well-known historical events or uh, pivotal moments. This connects to recent developments in anthropology that focus on the importance of the senses in people's lives uh, and in research. So the idea of this is that people's talk is um, only one way of understanding their lives and uh, places. So it doesn't capture sensory aspects uh, very effectively. What I found in my uh, fieldwork and interviews with people is a deep engagement with the past through sensory remembering. Basically, how people remember sights, sounds, sensations, smells very vividly and clearly. So I'm not a psychologist, a psychologist, but these ways of remembering seem uh, to be uh, qualitatively different from the way we might remember things in normal circumstances. So I began to wonder why this is. Uh, it may be that sensory dimensions of memory are heightened in situations of loss or grievance, uh, probably something that I need to think uh, uh, about, you know, a thing from psychology. But I also believe that this is in some way a constructive memory practice of rebuilding and inhabiting the places and times of their past. So it is imaginative work, not in, uh, in the sense that it is wrong or fabricated, but because the sensory dimensions are a way of completing memory, making it as full and realistic as possible in the mind. So um, uh, now I want to bring you back to the respondent and uh, to his interview, uh, again, Dimitris, uh, with me to give you a sense of uh, his memory world. As I said, Dimitris had to leave Istanbul in 1964 because of the expulsion uh, of people with, uh, with Greek citizenship uh, in the same year. So here, um, the, uh, just a... I'll give you one example of his uh, interview content. So the memory world is also a sense world and the sensory aspect of remembering is a key part of an act of uh, mental and atmospheric uh, recon reconstruction. Uh, so this is an example of kinds of interview that I do. 
and how vividly uh, people remember, as you see. Uh, so like, this is just a bit of a tiny part of the interview, by the way, normally I get, you know, longer <laughs> ones. So I want to show you to give you a sense of just how vivid, memory, with how vivid his memory is, even in terms of an old street sign about how steep the road was in a certain place and how rich in terms of sensory detail, the smell of bread, the taste of strawberries, the memory of a beautiful girl. It is like he's reconstructing in his memory what it felt like to be there at that time. And when he tells these stories, it's a way of preserving that. The street sign about using second gear really interests me as an entirely mundane minor thing that has uh, somehow become uh, etched into memory that is part of a wider reconstruction, uh, uh, re reconstructive action of uh, inhabiting the past in the mind. It is as, uh, it is as far from the understanding of uh, uh, authorized heritage discourse as it is possible to get. But in this uh, incidental example, the past is made rich in the mind. Uh, even if it is apparently unimportant, for me it classes as the profound knowledge that isn't usually spoken of, as I mentioned in the Sarah Pink quotation a minute ago. It's also not just about uh, what he says, but how he says it, sometimes with his body language and tone of voice, sometimes with photographs and keepsakes. So here, I just want to give you a sense of how uh, we go uh, look at photographs and he's telling me their stories. Uh, and you will hear his uh, excitement when he, when he finally reads the small sign in the photograph and where uh, this photograph was taken, where his parents were. I, I hope it will work, it's only a minute. Uh, this is a recording from our interview. That's good, あ、じゃあ、じゃあ、じゃあ、じゃあ、じゃあ、じゃあ、じゃあ、じゃあ、じゃあ、じゃあ、じゃあ、じゃあ、じゃあ、じゃあ、じゃあ、じゃあ、じ
uh, we could uh, we could discuss uh, parts of it um, and what it and and how you actually go about doing it. I think that's an interesting, at least methodological point. But I would actually like by uh, like to start by um, by looking at this uh, quote here from Annette Kuhn and and because uh, I think that goes at to the heart of also what we discussed before about you know the relationship between the private, the, even sometimes the secret. Uh, personal memory, and then the um, the larger spheres, the community, uh, maybe the city, maybe in some cases the nation, and so on. Um, because, um, yeah, um, I guess my, my question, coming back to what we talked about before, is, is again, uh, if, if we want to label something heritage, does it does it not need to, you know, tie into uh, collective or shared or joined uh, memory worlds? We could also ask about your concept of memory world, which is really intriguing as well. Is it possible? Do you see each person? Do you see each person having their own memory world, or or do you see your project more as someone who is trying to paint uh, or map? I know you'll be talking about a map also. Uh, or map uh, a more uh, a more shared kind of um, world, if you will. Uh, I guess. I, do you know what I mean? Is is I know that everything is connected and the private is connected to the to the other layers. But but um, surely, when we're talking about uh, the recognition uh, of a group like the marginalized groups that you're working with here. Um, a memory world would would have to go beyond the individual, I suppose. Mm -hmm. or, or or how do you see that? Mm -hmm. So uh, I think uh, uh, people already per personalize heritage a lot. Uh, they often identify as you know part of historical groups or cultures. Um, I mean, not just in ethnic or religious terms. You know, it's quite a you. I'm meaning in the wider concepts. So we can also think more creatively about how we as people bear certain heritages, how we carry certain heritages, how they appear in our interests, way of life or appearance. I mean, with appearance, a bit like uh, uh, Bordeaux's uh, sense of habitus as history, uh, uh, history written in our bodies. Um, so I think uh, the division between heritage and humans is also something we need to question, uh, like physical things and humans, you know, all these divisions. We, I think we, all, we, we, we need to, okay, I, I'm not completely, you know, breaking them, but we really have to ask questions uh, about these uh, uh, borders. Uh, so uh, I think heritage is understood uh, or understood as something that humans visit like a site or something they do like intangible heritage. But recent work in heritage studies is actually also starting to challenge that and uh, look at heritage as something that is part of people's lives and not just in physical things. Uh, it can be in, you know, in the relations between things and assemblage of objects, sites, meanings, I don't know, memories or atmospheres that we talked about. Uh, so that makes it hard to manage. And although our management practices uh, look after some of uh, some aspects of heritage and it's usually, you know, building heritage. So uh, it's built heritage. So they don't encompass all of them. Uh, and of course, I'm not saying we shouldn't, we should, but we should also, you know, think what we, don't also, uh, uh, you know, uh, preserve. So, so some things remain uh, uncared for, uh, and except by people like my participants, you know, who are, <laughs> and they're getting old. <laughs> so we need to, as you know, people who are working in heritage, we need to think about that. And with physical sites, you know, even, even I, I sometimes think about my personal uh, stories as well. Uh, you know, my mom's in my mom's village. There was a like you know ruin uh, from ancient times, 
And I, when, of course, you know, as a heritage person, you know, I, as a person who's interested in heritage, you know, loves visits and loves the style of building, but I also have childhood memories around it, like going to the fields and eating this amazing peach <laughs> or grapes next to, you know, that place. So I think that's what I mean. We need to stop putting all these places uh, into sort of boxes. Mm. Uh, so I think we need to make more connections between between these boundaries mm. that makes sense uh i hopefully i have a, I, have a um, I mean you're talking about this particular group but i suppose we could talk about um many other marginalized groups or groups who see themselves as marginalized in some cases uh, and and this is also of course where it becomes extremely uh, uh visible that that heritage work is political yeah uh, um, but could you say a little bit more about what what's it like to work amongst people who feel marginalized uh, and um, and of course this also leads up to another question that we can park for now but about your own role and about your own relationship to your uh, participants research mm -hmm. participants. Mm -hmm. I think Actually, I have a question here in the chat already. Already, yeah, okay, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> relates to this, I think it's from Milton Yastag, and he, he or she, sorry, yeah. asks. Uh, well, thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, about your feelings uh, mm -hmm. during your research uh, towards your findings. So I suppose this is about your own role as well. But I think Mel Meltem and Mas, I think it's a very important point. <laughs> We researchers always think about um, these uh, also boundaries. As I said, it always comes to these boundaries and uh, you know the lines we uh, put. I, my, my position is always you know we should be flexible. We can't mm. fix things uh, in, in 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 the way that um, all these policies uh, are structured. But anyway, mm. I'll start with like what you said about marginalization, and then I'll come to the position so um, although it's clear it is clear to me that there are obvious um, instances of marginalization and uh, persecution as I mentioned like you know pogrom and expulsion uh, 1964 expulsions but I never I, I re never really witnessed strong anger uh, about these uh, these injustices uh, within my field work. You know, I was actually a bit surprised <laughs> about that. And that may be because they happened a long time ago, but I think it is also something that people reflect on calmly, even if, even if it's sadness. Um, uh, I think it's mainly, I never come across with anger, but in the very extreme case, they don't want to talk to you at all because they are actually, I would say, heartbroken. They are sad and heartbroken. They don't want to talk about their time in Istanbul. Uh, so they completely shut it. But in other cases who are talking to me and they're actually, they love talking to me and they share, you know, all these stories with me. Uh, and they are, I would say, they're often uh, sad, uh, not angry. Mm -hmm. So um, also some of my respondents often tell happy stories about their early lives in Istanbul. So it's mixed as well. Like, you know, my field work is sometimes about, you know, quite heavy, emotional uh, in, in the sadness sense. But sometimes we have a lot of laughs, uh, especially with Dimitris, it's always <laughs> really both. <laughs> so, but even, I think my point will be uh, uh, like, uh, okay, even if they tell, you know, uh, their happy uh, times, uh, can be about the loss, but they can still have joyful memories as well. You know, they miss that. Mm. Uh, but even if marginalized people are calm and reflective about the past, mm. that doesn't mean their stories shouldn't be explored. And in my experience, they want to see recognition of their experiences. Uh, I mean, we mentioned this before, I know, but they just want that. I think that's what they are looking for. They're not Angry. They're not going to come and do the same violence. No, what they want is actually they want us to un understand, especially states to understand <laughs> their mm. uh, positions. 
Uh, I mean, I, like they, I, in my experience, what I see is they follow what's happening in Turkey. You know, they really follow it. They have actually Turkish TVs and stuff in their homes. Uh, and sometimes you see incidents like, you know, somebody's breaking the uh, a cross from a church. You know, it happened recently. One of my participants told me, I mean, you get these people everywhere. It doesn't matter. What matters is what states does. And when they see it, the Turkish police is there and or, it, you know, this guy is taken to the court. And if, you know, they follow that, if, if there is a recognition from the authorities that this is bad, you know, we need to protect churches, then they're happy. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, this, I'll stop here about that. I'll just come to uh, my position to, you know, all these complex <laughs> um, uh, emotions uh, and, margin, of course, harsh marginalization. So, uh, of course, in this case, I am sympathetic to the needs of, uh, uh, of the communities I work with. And what I'm doing in this project does relate it to a kind of uh, rebalancing uh, of historical knowledge. So that is fairer. I mean, and, you know, it's all I, I try to listen to them as much as I can and reflect, you know, their thinking. So in other research, I have worked with people and groups whose uh, views and attitudes I don't share. So this is at the moment, it's easy for me to sympathize and understand. But in the previous one, I really work with people that I, I, I totally <laughs> disagreed. Uh, in fact, uh, I have try really tried to do that uh, research because I thought, OK, it's also very important a way of uh, uh, sort of uh, it's very important to understand uh, the lives and beliefs of others as well. So even if you don't like them, you still need to understand. So that's what I try to do. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, I, although it wasn't very easy, uh, I tried to engage with them. But uh, I think this is also think that we think in uh, like Ayhan Kaya, for example, you might remember him. He works at Istanbul Bilgi University. He thinks about how can we, you know, um, study extreme extreme people. So that yeah. is also the you know. And yeah, I think, and I think this. I think is you have I also think. experience with that too. Yeah, I mean th these questions about. Um, studying groups that you whose whose views and politics you might not agree with uh, is also a question to myself because I've I've been doing this myself and I think it's uh, it's a very uh, you need to be sensitive and reflective as a researcher I mean you always do of course um, uh, in the same way as when you do a field work like you've done here with people uh, whose causes you might sympathize with, you also have to uh, take care uh, as to how you represent them and how you describe their, their motivations and so on. Um, I suppose there is a, sometimes you, uh, sometimes we could, we could quote this uh, difference between sympathy uh, which is uh, which is uh, one thing you might have, but but not necessarily uh, have in all cases. And then empathy, which is another uh, quality which I think is important as an ethnographer or as someone doing anthropological fieldwork to try to, you know, um, develop in 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 all cases. I mean, you can have empathy with people even if you can try to understand their view, even if you don't sympathize with it. Um, yeah. So, but but um, but yeah. So so this is really interesting, and we should probably get going, Gunilla. Yeah, sure. yeah. As yeah. well about the. Same. I think lastly, uh, yeah, I think I, for me the also the line is the ethics. <laughs> mm. So you know it goes to some kind. You know it might come to like this inaccurate views as well, or things that we don't like. I think we. we uh, you know, like, for example, Holocaust denials. I mean, what do you do with that? Mm. So I think, as you said, as a researcher there, you have to have your reflection and your position to judge on that. And I think for me, the guide, guide is the ethics. Mm. Mm. And then, of course, ethics is something that, that, at least in anthropology and ethnography, you will 
you will always work on, uh, even as you go along uh, on the field work, right? Uh, you, you will have to reflect continuously. Uh, I would like to talk much more about the census, but maybe we should we should have the um, okay, and then we come should to have the rest of your of your presentation, and then we could also ask people as they've begun to do to uh, to write questions. Um, yeah, yeah, sure, they can and, start. And I will I will pick, uh, pick <laughs> some of them, uh, but um, yeah, please go ahead, go ahead. Okay, okay. this is going to be the last part, and I will talk. I will tell more stories and some. Uh, yeah, I will talk about the memory map now. So um, I mentioned before that a lot of uh, what I gave, uh, what I engage uh, with in terms of heritage is not recognized uh, in official heritage. It isn't shown in museums, uh, which focus on dominant heritages. It isn't incorporated into heritage sites uh, interpretation. So I think uh, it is important to find other methods and platforms for recognizing and making visible these uh, otherwise hidden histories, which are also at risk of disappearing. So to do this, I work with two main platform uh, platforms. One is a digital memory uh, map. Uh, the other is a film, but I don't have time to talk about film. Uh, at, at the very end, I'll just tell you what it is, that's all. So the aim here is literally to map people's memory and senses of heritage, but also to think about where heritage is in a kind of network between stories, people, objects, images, and meanings. This is a way of providing a digital showcase for heritages that are missing from the official record. Uh, it is also a community resource that my participants feel strongly about. In a sense, what I'm trying to capture is the memory world in which people live because uh, of their personal and community histories. Uh, this is a map which geolocates particular things that you can uh, search with, stories, sites, sounds, dates, images and uh, objects. I'll give, as I said, I'll give you just uh, a couple of examples that will both show you how the map works and give you a sense of what sort of material I'm collecting. And uh, here, if you click on the site tab, you see the locations of the stories. Um, the locations, as you can see, in, uh, uh, include uh, Athens as well. Uh, and if you go on to, you know, stories, you can uh, click on which story you want to read uh, with images, sometimes with sounds and sometimes with uh, videos. Like here, I'm, as I said, I'm also collecting uh, sounds. So um, if you visit the website, you will actually get some sound files uh, as well. So for example, this is a sound of Thanasis, who is in his uh, 80s now, and a graduate from the school and me, uh, walking up the stairs and into the classrooms of the Fenar Greek, uh, Fenar Greek Orthodox High School uh, in, in Istanbul. You can hear him unlocking the doors too, if you listen to it. I mean, I, the reason I recorded this was because they were talking about the sound of the stairs. So that's how uh, I capture things. If it appears uh, in my data and uh, uh, important to people, then yes, I try to capture that. And in, in, in my data, usually schools, churches, and sometimes hospitals are actually key sites with, uh, within the memory map. So one example, uh, so I want to give you one example from the memory map that is itself a form of a memory map. Dimitris uh, Vafiadis Daravanolu, uh, I think he's he, he here today, if you are here. Hi, Dimitri. So uh, he's a member of the Greek uh, community of Istanbul, but also has Armenian and Italian roots in his family. He still lives in Istanbul. He's in his uh, 30s and working as an electrical engineer. He has been interested in his family history and developing his own museum with his family history from 1800s, their objects and a large photo archive. He wants to tell the story of non-Muslim communities of Istanbul through his family history and share it, share it with wider audiences. To do this, he has established a website called Dimitri Museum. He talks about family members, the souvenirs that they uh, bought on their trips, stories of weddings, baptisms, 
and some of the difficult experience that they faced, including the 1955 pogrom that profoundly affected the future of the non-Muslim communities of Turkey. I interviewed Dimitris and I selected some of the, uh, some objects according to what he mentioned to me in our conversation. So I don't have, uh, so uh, first of all, before I give uh, one the, uh, example, I just want to say what we have in the memory map itself is a form of re a reconstruction, a piecing together of materials and memory actions, people's stories, the locations, historic photographs, sometimes placed in combination with modern photographs of the same place as it is today. So at one level, I'm engaging with how people reconstruct the past imaginatively. On another level, I'm extending that uh, reconstructive work by making a platform for such reconstruction, as well as placing individual uh, people's memory practices into a larger social context. It is important that this is a co-production, so I work with participants to do this. So there is always an exchange about how, in effect, we should create people's memories. Uh, sometimes this involves uh, interesting dialogues, like, uh, for example, people asking me to make it look good, to present their <laughs> story beautifully. And sometimes they are not sure if they're telling me an interesting story to go onto a website or into a book. Uh, and when they see uh, that it's actually is important and they they're happy about it. <laughs> so I think it, I think in heritage and memory practice, we live with with these paradoxes, uh, paradoxes of uh, reconstruction as something that is both selective and layered. But there are ways in which this can be put to ethical use, serving a marginalized community whose uh, heritage and memories at risk of loss. So, uh, as I said, I don't have time to go through this very extensively, but I'll give you one example from the uh, object that I put on my memory map. Hurmusius Bafiadis, he is the great grandfather of Dimitris. Uh, this is, we are talking about young Dimitris, not the previous one, <laughs> too many Dimitrises <laughs> uh, in my work. So, so he was a collector. He was known for going to auctions to collect antique souvenirs. However, he stopped collecting after the 1955 pogrom targeting the, targeting the Greek communities of Istanbul. This plate is called the survivor by Dimitris's family, because when the attackers smashed their home, this plate uh, managed to survive, although it here to be put back together. I mean, if you look at carefully, you will see a little thin line that was repaired. Dimitris notes, this plate is one of the important projects for our family as a sur sur um, uh, uh, important object for our family as a survivor. It, remi it reminds us of those days, but also shows us to be survivors of bad days. So I want to finish with a second chandelier story. The chandelier, uh, this chandelier is in Athanasius home in Athens. He brought in in the 1980s from his family's flat in Afrika Han, a well-known inn in Beolu, Istanbul. The chandelier was a wedding gift to his grandfather from one of his closest friends, a chef at the famous Tokatlian Hotel. Athanasius' grandfather married in 1914 in Kadıköy in Istanbul. He worked as an electrician who did the electrics of the Afrika Han, where he later lived. A man called Rakup Pasha built uh, and owned the Han. According to Athanasios, he rented out the inn to non-Muslims. Athanasios said this chandelier is important to him because it reminds him of Istanbul. It now hangs from the ceiling of his bedroom in Athens. But in the old days, it was in the living room. He remembers doing his homework underneath it. Um, he was attending Zapion Greek School at the time. He said there was another living room, but it was close to him since it was only opened for guests. So he spent a lot of time under the chandelier. When he hung it in his new home in Athens, he had to shorten the long chain quite a lot as it was designed for the high ceilings uh, of flats in Beolu, in Istanbul. 
So the uh, the uh, story tells a lot, uh, uh, as you can see. So you clearly get the sense of the intensity that domestic space can have, how certain environments become uh, ingrained into our histories. For example, because of the hours we spend doing homework, I was also keen to, keen to include uh, the apparently minor detail about how the chain had to be shortened for the lower ceilings of Athens, which says something about the material, materiality of displacement or uh, the displacement of material, the transplanting of things from one space into another for which they were not designed, making adaptations uh, necessary. The chandelier thus always occupies two, space, two spaces. It always brings to mind the high ceilings of Beolu, even though the chain is short now, and it is in, a, a, in an uh, Athens apartment. It's also occupying different temporal, uh, temporalities, the long hours of childhood homework, the temporality of the present, and the temporality of the journey. The chandelier becomes a kind of uh, bridge for memory travel between times and places. The chandelier is also embedded in family history, the social structures of Istanbul, the lives of non-Muslims, and even the fact that a good room would, uh, would be kept for guests, which in a way uh, intensifies the presence of the chandelier in his memory world. This goes back to uh, Anet Kuhn co uh, quote. Uh, this is an object and uh, not an uh, image, but it is still part of a network of meanings that bring together the personal with the familial, the cultural, the economic, the social, the historical. Uh, so, my second final slide is an advert for my next book, uh, which I'm busy writing, sort of. <laughs> Making worlds of memory of uh, different kinds, uh, verbal, sensory, material, uh, emotional, is a means of return, but it is always compromised. When people spend time with their photograph collections or tell joyous, funny stories of how they, they went to church as teenagers because it was the only place they could meet girls or boys uh, their own age. How they would be followed all the way home by the wonderful smell of fresh debate be there. This is always a return, a way of inhabiting again the time place, uh, time place of the mind. But this return is bookended by loss, and by the memory of difficult experiences and juries. This loss persists in the invisibility of their stories in uh, official histories and heritage representations. This leads me to the question of where heritage and memory reside. The answer is not just in historic urban fabric, but perhaps in a churchyard, perhaps in a box of photographs, perhaps in a story or in the speaking voice and body of an old man or, ma uh, uh, or, or woman. But in fact, it resides in all of these simultaneously and interrelationally. The book will pro propo uh, proposes that people uh, live with and in the past through relational, affective, sensory and material memory practice. Recognition of this and the private everyday stories that the book opens up suggests uh, the need for careful thought about how we conceive of uh, and value heritage and about how to honor the world of memory made by communities. This opens questions about whether and how official heritage practices, whether at national or international levels, are currently capable of recognizing and safeguarding these apparently minor heritages that have such powerful meaning for communities. The examples I have used can seem uh, microscopic uh, in focus, a single story or a uh, object 
or a display in the corner of someone's living room. But my aim is to show how uh, these can be opened out to be uh, micros microscopic, uh, microsco micros microcosmic, and how they work as part of memory assemblages through which people live with the past. They also point to the importance of the personal and private as a dimension of heritage that is undervalued in official and even scholarly practice. Uh, this opens important questions about whether and how official heritage practices, whether at national or international levels, are currently capable of recognizing and safeguarding these apparently minor heritages that have such powerful meaning for communities. Should official practices uh, change and adapt? Or should we env envisage the empowerment of new heritage actors and the development of new forms and politics of recognition? Or should just things just stay in the living room? So, and okay, I finished, it's just, uh, you know, I want to tell you about the film. Uh, so just, uh, so I made this film with Cem Hakverdi at Istanbul uh, Bilgi University. So it's called Life After Life. Uh, and this is a story of the historic uh, room, uh, Greek population of Istanbul, uh, told through personal stories and, uh, and community life. So one of the stories in the film is how we follow Dimitris's effort to honor his parents' wishes to rebury their bones in the Balıklı room cemetery in Istanbul alongside the bodies of their parents and ancestors. Uh, so we will do some screenings in Turkey and in Greece, of course, uh, once the COVID situation uh, allows us. So I will say, Watch out for this and hopefully we'll meet somewhere <laughs> in Greece or in Turkey. Okay, uh, well, we can move to the next part, but I think maybe I'll stop sharing my screen now. <laughs> thank you, Gunnar. Uh, that was excellent. Uh, and thank you everyone for staying with us. Uh, I had a few saying in the chat that they had to run. But uh, uh, I would really like to uh, encourage uh, all of you, if you have questions or comments, to, to write them to me in the chat. Uh, uh, I will then uh, read aloud. I have, I have other questions, but really, if you have um, some, I think it's important that you get the chance to, uh, to put them to Bruno. Um, thank you, Bruno. I, I think this really summed it up well, and I... I uh, as you know, I like your idea about the map, and I mean the map and the film really shows. I mean, it rounds it off well because it, it shows what you mean by by this sensory ethnography and and by um, and, and and how your work differs from you know um, many others who who don't make maps or make films necessarily. Uh, I think um, uh, I think it. It also goes to show that you, I mean, in, in and this is in response to some of my own questions in the beginning, maybe, that some of the responses that you are yourself, I mean, you are co-constructing, you are yourself a participant in the safeguarding and in the, the sharing and actually in construct, maybe, I don't know if this is too much to say, uh, you, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but in a sense, you are, creating parts of these memory worlds. And I suppose that your uh, participants and discussion partners are also, when they go to the website or when they see the film, they are also, you know, uh, reconnecting to, to others uh, who have uh, experiences or histories similar to themselves. So in that sense, you are an active part of this very project, which is, uh, which to some, audience members may sound like a, a very uh, a non-objective kind of research, but it's actually very much at the heart of what, what uh, many anthropologists and ethnographers do, I would say. So, um, so, so this was just my own comment uh, that, uh, that I would like to, to put. Um, I also have some, some more questions about your, the differences in your material and so on, but I would like to, uh, 
um, to actually take a question from Stelios Likakis that was just put in chat. Hi, Stelios. Thanks. Uh, hi, Gunnar. Thank you, he says, from, for this brilliant presentation. I was wondering, apart from the digital map and the film, do you have any ideas on how to promote or exhibit this non-monumental pieces of heritage? Um, so how do we go about promoting uh, or making things known, I suppose. Uh, maybe this goes back to my first question about mm -hmm. whether the corner in the living room was just for himself or is it also for others to enjoy and share? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we have any ideas how to promote, well, how to promote exhibit this non-monumental pieces of heritage is hard. <laughs> Certainly. First of all, you know, you need some appetite for it too and support. And uh, especially when you have to deal with officials and stuff, I don't think it's easy. And also policymakers, you know, um, it's just not easy. I know that our task is hard, but that doesn't mean we should not try. <laughs> if you don't do anything, nothing will happen. <laughs> you know, and I think uh, engaging way is a uh, First of all, I didn't have the film idea or digital mapping and stuff. I was just um, my most the most active uh, uh, way of engaging this was, you know, going to the field and talking to them and writing a book or, you know, or going to conferences or giving such talks and stuff. But I could see that that was necessary to, you know, we find other ways. And uh, I mean, it still is not enough, it's not easy, but at least it's like my position is better than nothing. At least it's, you know, with, with the film uh, so far, you know, uh, when we watched with some people, you know, people uh, understood and, you know, they don't necessarily read the academic books or go to academic talks. So I think my plan is to, in fact, I plan some um, public events like in a historic school in Istanbul and there's one a, a NGO uh, actually two NGOs related to uh, rooms and I'm in contact with other places so you know apart from just academic environments I'm also organizing uh, some uh, you know public events that help uh, uh, and uh, yeah, at the moment with COVID, it's a bit complicated, but it will happen <laughs> for sure. Uh, and I think the other, I mean, uh, I was fortunate to stay here, so we can talk about that again a bit more. <laughs> but uh, the other way is I think apps, you know, uh, mobile phones, everyone has got mobile phones. And uh, I, these are actually quite simple. Uh, applications that you can create. In fact, I was involved in one uh, work in Istanbul again, and we just created, we did, we worked with the communities and created this very basic app. So what happens is, you know, we can just download it easily and, uh, you know, we can listen to some other uh, stories as well. So there are ways, and, and also when you use technology, it doesn't have to be complicated. I mean, my memory map is quite basic. Now I can, I, I actually run it. Okay, I had a designer, he set up for me, uh, but you know, I'm, I'm able to, uh, you know, uh, uh, operate it easily. Thank you, Gunil. Uh, and this actually ties into something I, I wrote on my uh, notes here when, while you talked, uh, social media, question mark. Uh, and, and I must admit, I know very little about, uh, um, you know, social media myself. I'm, I'm not an avid user of it, but I know of some colleagues uh, also working with Sarah Pink, by the way, oh, uh, nice. who have looked into, you know, the way in which, especially, of course, younger generations utilize um, social media of different kinds to, uh, to organize, orient themselves, but also organize um, uh, communities and so on and and um, so I don't expect you to, to talk a lot about social media but maybe this could be then related to another question I had about you know the differences in your uh, empirical material and, and here I'm talk I'm thinking about uh, I mean most of the people that you that you talked about today were of the elderly generation and you say some of them are in their 80s and and uh, this is also of course a reason for you to go and collect stuff now yeah. but but could you say something about um, uh, age differences or generational differences in your material actually i would also ask about differences in other ways for instance about your i know you're working both in athens 
uh, with uh, and in 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 Istanbul. So so with diaspora and and with people who stayed. So could you say a little bit about um, the generational differences and maybe also the geographical ones, if there mm -hmm. are patterns there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's all again another very important point. <laughs> well, points uh, <laughs> if you're working with communities. Uh, because as I said, we really have to be careful uh, about not making like one homogenized story and generalization. And, you know, I still say, okay, I try to understand the complexity of this memory and heritage, but I'm still saying this is my sample and it exists, uh, you know, not like whole rooms are, you know, feeling like this. I mean, I don't know, I, I still continue with my research and each time I discover something new and I understand something a bit better and so on. So um, there is not one single story here. That's, that's the main thing. So we are dealing with heterogeneous uh, communities. Some remained in Istanbul, some were expelled, some, uh, some intermarried or came from mixed backgrounds like we saw with Dimitris, like Italian Armenian backgrounds. So as a start, see we already, <laughs> you know, telling different, uh, different uh, uh, situations and uh, places. So there are some differences. Obviously the diaspora room uh, are reflecting on displacement and older generations sometimes have in mind an Istanbul, that is different from present day Istanbul. But often they know what, uh, they know that very well. Uh, like in the film, hopefully you will all have a chance to watch it one day. You will see an older lady says that she loves Istanbul, but not the modern Istanbul. She says, uh, you know, she loves old Istanbul, Eski Istanbul. So the nostalgia and the sense of change is quite obvious. And of course, the room in Istanbul have experienced uh, change as a continuity because they were always there. So their experiences and outlook can be different. Uh, I may be able to say more about that probably in the future because you know I'm going to spend hopefully more time uh, in Istanbul with them. Uh, I don't want to generalize uh, for now, of course. So one interesting factor is the role of institutions in making a bridge between the communities. Uh, like schools are really interesting, uh, are here, is interesting here, uh, uh, where alumni organizations and anniversaries are an important aspects of col uh, school uh, culture. And rooms who live in Athens or elsewhere visit the Greek schools of Istanbul and actually they come together every, I don't know, they have, different kind of celebrations like every uh, 50th uh, 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 graduates year. So they all come together, you know, some of them are in Istanbul, some of them are in Athens, some of them are in Australia. So these institutions bring them together. And I experienced their relationship with the school. It was very, very similar. They were very attached to their schools. I mean, in Athens, they actually meet regularly about their schools and they work with uh, you know, remaining uh, rooms. So these are important moments of connection and community uh, coherence of probably, you know, we can say um, across times and places. Yes, thanks. Um, I think what you just said reminded me of another question that we haven't really touched upon. I mean, you, you are obviously talking about people who have felt a loss or displacement even. Um, some of them are longing for particular versions of Istanbul or former lives and so on. Uh, and, uh, and some are clearly, like, like you say, some are clearly nostalgic or even, um, you know, romanticizing, uh, you know, particular kinds of pasts. Uh, and in some in some research, that some kinds of research, this would be seen as you know problematic, you know. Um, but I, I suppose my question is: Is it important to you whether these kind of recollections are accurate or authentic uh, in relation to the historical record, or uh, how does accuracy, if if at all, uh, enter into this? Um, yeah. 
Could you say a little yeah. bit about that nostalgia, longing, and so on? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, um, in in many cases, uh, accurate remembering is not what I'm interested in. So, because my interest is um, how and why people remember, not checking their memories for uh, factual, factual mistakes, uh, which would be uh, quite difficult work anyway. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I've got experience of being an, uh, I mean, I mentioned this before, I think, to you. Uh, so uh, I, I have experience of being an interview uh, where a colleague corrected a historical error made by a participant and almost told them off uh, when they didn't know something. And for me, uh, this misses the whole point. So uh, I didn't use that interview for my work. Uh, I don't know what they did, but I didn't. So I'm not testing people's historical knowledge like a school exam. I'm not trying to understand what is going on. Uh, uh, well, I'm, I'm trying to understand what's going on in their uh, memory world. And, you know, what this memory world means as part of their lives. Uh, if pe and also if people are nostalgic and the way uh, they remember is not uh, not really how things were, which is often the case with <laughs> nostalgia. Again, I heard from one uh, a, a, a researcher said, well, this is all nonsense because this is all fake nostalgia. Well, then if, you know, if it's important to people and if it doesn't harm other people, why should we, you know, uh, why should we have a problem with that? Mm. So it's, I think it's much more important to understand what nostalgia is like and why. That's my interest. And I'm mm. not, you know, and, yeah. and, and it's there. And I, and I think, again, we, we had this conversation maybe, again, uh, we are humans and I personally get nostalgic too. I mean, it's normal. But as I, again, it comes to, you know, again, as we talked about it, uh, just uh, what, uh, you know, now, like um, comes to uh, if, 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 if it's used in hateful or problematic ways, then yeah, we have to think about the, as I said before, ethics side of it. How mm -hmm. do we deal with it? But if it's not in that zone, you know, why not? <laughs> yes. I don't have any problem. No, I completely agree. I mean, but it, it is a very important uh, discussion, I think, because of course there are uh, historical projects which look at uh, historical periods and historical facts and, 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 and where accuracy in that sense is, is uh, key. But this uh, way of looking at heritage and memory, uh, I agree, is, is, um, is much more interested in how memory works, like you say, mm -hmm. or how nostalgia comes into play. Um, and, yeah. um, and then of course, there will be heritage experts, uh, museum experts and so on, who will uh, tell you, well, this map uh, might be interesting, but this and that and that, uh, factor is is wrong and therefore we cannot uh, label it as heritage you know we'll have these discussions uh, continue to have them with our fellow researchers from many other disciplines um, yeah. but, uh, um, I had that I had uh, got that comment a lot believe me <laughs> and clearly one uh, mm -hmm. architect told me you know she was into heritage but in a very conventional sense she, she told me my work was nonsense and where she said, "Where is heritage in this?" Mm. So uh, you, yeah, you do. You will. We will get this tension. But this is my position. But of course, you know, you said very well. Uh, we need to look at the framing. Like, okay, this is not a historical accuracy work. In fact, if let's say my participant got it wrong, like instead of 1955 pogrom, you know, he said he or she said 54. It's not going to change this fact. It's just got it wrong. I mean, also, how are we going to affect uh, affect some of the facts uh, in this respect? So we have to again. Th we, this is our job as well. Like as research, okay, you know what's going on here. And for example, one of my participants was really into uh, uh, accuracy in in his knowledge in relation to historical things. And I worked with him. You know, he went to the books and checked it. And it's up to him. He wanted to give me the right dates mm -hmm. and it was fine and we used it that way so again it depends what sort of work you are doing this is not like a you know fixed fact that i'm saying mm -hmm. but in this work 
I don't need, you know, accurate knowledge about uh, any. <laughs> of course, I mean, there's a whole other discussion to be had when we talk about history and the philosophy of history, because what is history itself? You know, many of the museums and the panoramas and so on that you've been looking at earlier are also picking and choosing, you could say, selecting particular histories, framing things in particular ways so that uh, you could say, uh, or I could at least say as an outsider that I think the panorama 19, uh, 1453 is also uh, romanticizing in its own way, uh, a certain kind of past, right? So, so maybe again, the point is that, that um, well, there are authorized heritages and there are unauthorized ones, but maybe some of the underlying operations are not that different after all. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. This is also my question to historians as well. You, you know, they have to speak with uh, archives, you know, documents, and uh, which is fine, of course. But mm. also if, if for me the same, like, what is it? Who said that? Who wrote that? Whose mm. views is that? I think the main thing is like questions. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and depends what we want we are what we are interested in of course and also you know these are really even in my uh, work these you know I'm not like a you know historian in the conventional sense but I, of course my work uh, also uh, aligns with uh, aligns the, with uh, history too and often you know people's memory and all these uh, spectacular events. Uh, you know, intersect uh, as well. So it's more complicated. Yeah, um, yeah of course. Uh, Gunilla, I think we should be sort of rounding off. I can see that some people are logging off. Yeah. I had some more questions, but in some ways you actually, I think your maps and your film actually sums up much of your, much of your approach. So I would say to uh, to um, audiences that now is uh, your last chance to pose a question. If yeah. <laughs> I think it's also late in Istanbul. It so, is late. Yeah, it's for me like nearly six o'clock and you are in a different zone, but not too late. <laughs> People yeah. must be tired. <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, and of course, it's also your chance uh, to round off, uh, Gunnel, if, um, if you want to mention things you haven't already done. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I can tell a lot more, <laughs> but I want to. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You've, you've made so, a point. You're, yeah, you're I think very for me, curious. Yeah, I think I just want to tell people who are interested in working with communities. I think it's a hard work. I mean, you know, like these kind of things, you know, you have to go back, come back and listen and hang out and all the, also it's not just one technique, you know, you, you have uh, certain questions or sometimes you have different setup, you know, it takes time. But mm -hmm. if you can work with communities, I think you have to make an effort. And sometimes if you get confused, I always, I mean, often, uh, find my answers in ethics <laughs> so and of course I think about my role in ethics and, and then mm. you know it's a complicated uh, work that we are doing because we're working with people and we have to be careful we have to respect I think respect is also another key word that I would use mm. so that's how I do it and you know when one when my participants watch the film they would, I mean, that was, of course, my first thing was they have to like it because they are part of it. It's their story. It's not my story. Mm -hmm. I'm just, you know, helping them to put it in some context. And uh, and they, they were so happy. And they, in fact, one of them said this was the best film that I've seen about Gurum communities. So, I, of course, I was so pleased and happy. Mm -hmm. And then, because, you know, the, the ma main thing is just listening and trying to understand and, you know, a little bit flexible about some certain methods or rules or policies. I uh, think exactly. then that helps. And of course, it's challenging too. And sometimes you might get it wrong. I don't know what you would think, but if you make mistakes, it's fine. You can make mistakes. But the important thing is, you know, think about why, uh, you know, we made a mistake and we change it and so on. So questions, questions, <laughs> and thinking, a lot of and, thinking. And I, I, for one, really look forward to, to seeing the film and, and also visiting the website. I, I mean, I had a, we don't have time, but, but there is still something about the, the sensory impressions that I would like to uh, talk to you about. If we can do that at another time, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> you know, time how, how do you, <laughs> you can see, of course, how you, how you can present the texts, the, the film bits, 
the uh, even the sounds in your in your map and in your in your files. What about smells and taste and these things? I mean, you can have people tell about them in words, but are there ways in which smells and tastes and these non, I don't know, non reproducible almost uh, memories could be, uh, you know, um, communicated or mm -hmm. I don't know, safeguarded is a UNESCO word, but, but yeah, uh, maybe you could have recipes of old, uh, of old meals that would uh, that would be a way of reproducing it's taste. Way, yes, but again, I think it's the atmosphere that helps. You know how they remember, how they uh, uh, co construct the memory. That's why I was interested in all these details. Mm -hmm. Maybe we cannot uh, construct smell, but actually we can sense it because of the, all these. Uh, vivid memories and descriptions and the atmosphere that uh, you know my participants uh, make. That's why I often you know also film it and stuff because sometimes they describe it there by the languages and voice and stuff. So if I'm going to talk about that, at least it, it supports my <laughs> description. Mm -hmm. And then you can probably you know uh, as a reader uh, imagine. So that's why I think it's important. And again, all these senses, emotions, you know, I really had no idea and I wasn't interested in at all. In fact, I have some <laughs> distance with emotions, but I, I can't get away from it because it's there. So mm -hmm. it comes from people's relationship, people's rememberings, people, you know. So I think if you want to understand communities, senses are uh, extra layers uh, for for information. So it tells us more. It may, it supports us to understand more about their world and heritage. Uh, so, yeah. Thank and you. I will, <laughs> I would I will take the chance or the or the, or the the opportunity to to thank you. This was really interesting. I learned a lot. I am uh, oh. <laughs> in the fortunate position that we can talk uh, about this again sometime. But I also thank the audience. Thank you for sticking with us and uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. I get a lot of comments saying that uh, you did enjoy it. Oh, um, so uh, with that said, I would hand the uh, word over to uh, Vasiliki again. And um, yeah, thank you for us from us. Thank you both very, very much for your participation today and for this insightful discussion on uh, how memory culture explores the personal memories of individuals. I, I am one of these uh, uh, who enjoyed it so very much, also being Greek, uh, maybe this matters more. And thank you all for participating um, today to our audience. The sound recording will be soon uploaded on our SoundCloud account and the video on our YouTube channel. Uh, our talks will continue in September 14 with Anthony Calvelis, a professor and chair of the Department of Classics at Ohio State University. Good evening, everyone.